rights for him. Me and you dirty little pig, you. I'm going to have to reach out to... Um, Jason. Ha <laughs> ha, you son of a bitch. I'm going to reach out to uh, Jason from OverTheCap.com. Don't ever touch my moves again. They're a lot lower than they used There's to be. My... Whoa. <laughs> well, it's that, it's that nipple ring. It's easy to tell what hemisphere they're in. It's the at. chain that connects them both. Um, <laughs> that's what you hit. You hear the yeah. clink? Yeah. Yeah. Is that why you weigh 270 now? Yeah, right. Sports is proud to partner with Mr. Rogers Homes. Sean Rogers is a proud Western New Yorker and is now your Arizona relocation specialist. You can see his reviews as a top 1% agent on Zillow, Homes, and Trulia.com. Go ahead and download his free Arizona relocation guide found in the description of this video. Subscribe to his YouTube channel and, as Sean would say, God bless America and go Bills. What are you down to? 235. Ooh. You know how many bags of sand I'd have to hold to get to 235? <laughs> <No. laughs> Paul, I like to play a game. Okay. <laughs> this isn't Jigsaw, though. <laughs> Would you like to play a game? Um, I want you... I think we've done this a couple of years now. Uh, at least on YouTube, I remember it. I will name an offensive player. You name a defensive player. Okay. Give me the first word that comes to mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This will be fun. Um, and and the reason why you say that word. Okay, so offense player, defensive player. I'll name offense. You name defense. Okay. I knew it. <laughs> first word. Prestige. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Your first word in entertainment. First word. <laughs> um, Zach Moss. Hey, you saw it. <laughs> um, developing. And, and here's why I say developing. Okay. Zach Moss did not look great at the beginning of the season. Nope. Right? But the NFL speed is a lot different. No preseason games. Nope. Right? Nope. So it's that's a tough situation to throw a running back in. Like, rookie okay, right, exactly. A rookie running back saying, okay, kid, here you go. Especially for the fact that they were playing, you know, carousel with the offensive line the first five games of the season. Like, I, developing. I, I'm actually excited to see what Zach Moss does. And I still am very much under the belief that they like Zach Moss more than they like Devin Singletary. So, developing. It's like, <laughs> it's like is it there? A couple sitting there, and then, you know, they want to have a kid. They adopt Devin Singletary, but then they have a child sex wise. Yeah. Like, yeah. well, you know what? Um, I thought you were going to say starter. Oh, I, okay. I, saw, I just put it up on a tee for I thought you were going to say starter. If you said Matt Breida, I would have said starter. Oh, my God, I forgot. <laughs> I am, listen, I am A.J. McCarron in on Matt Breida. Oh, my if God. If you know this yes. channel... You know, I carried a candle for AJ McCarron to Buffalo oh. for five years oh. from the draft and every season afterwards. I was like, hey, AJ McCarron. We oh, had uh, McCarron. in our podcast days, we yeah. had a bet. We had a bet going on and we were picking teams every week to see who would, you know, win the season out. Paul literally picked every team against the Vikings. Because he thought the Vikings would have gotten the first pick and would have taken A.J. McCarron. Sure did. No, I no, was no. all in. Pur purposely, like, through the picks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at a game that the Vikings absolutely could have won, but, like, nope, they got to draft A.J. McCarron. They're in troubles. No. Yep. Oh, somebody actually said to me, because I was out in public with the Bills' A.J. McCarron shirt, he's like, is that an A.J. McCarron shirt? <laughs> the name's on the back. Yes, it's an A.J. McCarron shirt. There's no hiding. It's an AJ McCarron shirt. I go, yeah, I was I was pretty excited when he signed. My buddy bought me this. <laughs> and he's like, that is awesome. <laughs> it's almost Bryce Puff-esque. It's yeah, it's like having a Koi Wire jersey. <laughs> right? Like when you just love a player, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna make this work. I'm gonna will them to success. Koi wire. Good lord. I'm sure AJ McCarron appreciated the seven cents that he got from the Players Association for royalties for the one AJ McCarron Bill shirt that they made. They got shipped to Lockport, New York. He uh, was even as confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, defense. F.A. Obata. 
<sighs> He's a tough one, man. I am. I am so. I. I am. I am very conflicted with Fa Obata. So I want to know Fa Obata. Fa Obata. Twenty five percent. Okay. I think that um, he will be. He will be a practice squad guy. Okay. I think you can put. He still has he, eligibility or no? He. I think he does. Would, Not the international eligibility. No, he, yeah, that's gone. No, he would still have technically okay, regular practice squad I, I think squad he may have some practice squad eligibility. If he does, I think they might do that on a game-by-game -game basis. Okay. And he is your insurance policy. But I think he's going to be a defensive tackle rotation, um, not a defensive end rotation, as we talked about on a previous episode one time. But I think he'll, he'll play about 25% <clears throat> of the snaps this year. I think he'll play a quarter of the snaps on the defensive front of rotation. I think putting him next to Ed Oliver would be a freaking terrifying sight. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Barb, because I look at Obata as the fifth defensive end. Like, we talked about it in oh, another okay. episode this week where the Bills typically only carry five defensive ends. It's Jerry Hughes and the three guys you drafted. Okay, so there you go. And Obata. Well, because Obata can play special teams for you. He can play defensive tackle for you. He just fits that mold of being versatile. And that's why I think Mario Edison probably is going to make make the roster. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I have no if, reason to believe that. If I could bring up a blast from the past, we talked about Lorenzo Alexander playing a defensive tackle role, yeah. defensive end role, yeah. may, and special teams. Maybe yeah. he's that hybrid that you brought in yeah. to fulfill those roles in that respect. And he's a very coachable kid, mm -hmm. um, has familiarity with Carolina, obviously. So uh, who knows what uh, what the future will bring with Obata? But I think I think about twenty five percent of the snaps I, I ballpark for him to actually play like. People might not think he's going to get a lot of time. I think he'll be in that rotation. Mm -hmm. Forest Lamp. I love Lamp. <laughs> That's not one word. <laughs> when Forest Lamp signed with Buffalo, I was in, I had just gotten my COVID shot. I remember exactly where I was. I just got my COVID shot at the transit drive in, and I sat there. And I argued with myself about starting an episode because I did go live. You did. I, I fought with myself over starting the episode with Life is Like a Box of Chocolates reference from Forrest Gump. And I didn't. With that being said. You can go so many places with him. Yeah, I know. It's so easy. It's like pitching to a healthy Luke Gehrig. Starter. Starter. Forrest Lamp is your starting. You lap put him guard. over Ike Buck. I do. I do. I Lamp for shame. Well, Lamp started last year yes. with Herbert at, at at quarterback, right? Very and similar. really and really hadn't started prior to that, right? Hadn't started a lot prior to that. Had some interspersed starts, but for the most part was the, was the starting guard. Yes. Did they run the ball effectively? I think you know for what that team was. I think they were effective. They were in almost every single game. They were. Right? They lost a lot of games by one score. I don't really put that on Lamp. Obviously, they ran the ball effectively enough. They threw the ball effectively enough. They put up points. Yeah, they scored. So I, I think Lamp is probably a little underappreciated for how good a signing it is. With that being said, I do not expect a re-signing of Forest Lamp, right? So I think he's your starter this year. And then you still got Mongo. Uh, you, you still have options. They don't really – they're not shy about finding guards. Mm -hmm. But you bring in a guy who started six – the reason he signed here was because he said, I should start on this team, right? He started all 16 games last year. You look at this team and look at the guard position and say, who do I have to beat? I have to beat a guy who started seven games and was on the practice squad for two years, and I fucked her. I've got to beat Cody Ford, who – Yep. Just, just, go, just gloss over it. We've already yeah. beat him up enough. Yeah, I just, I have to. And he, if he feels he can beat Cody Ford, that's his opinion. Doesn't matter whether it's exactly the same as ours. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter. I have to beat Mongo, who is one Mitch Morris injury away from having to play center anyway. Right? So there's opportunity here. He started 16 games last year. He could have picked out anyway. of a few places where to go. And he went with Buffalo on a one-year deal. I, I think he's your starter. I like it. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Lamp. Um, just for the sheer experience that he brings to the position. But once again, we talk about the theme of, of Bean and McDermott bringing in these guys that are insurance policies that you have. 
Now, I, w- I mentioned it on a previous episode, too. There is something very savvy to be said about you bringing in a guy in a one-year deal, starting him for 16 games. He signs a big contract somewhere else that you literally can't afford. And people will get – fans will get upset about that. They're like, oh, why didn't the Bills sign him? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a numbers game. If, you, if, if Forrest Lamp starts 16 games for the Buffalo Bills this year, plays well, signs a huge deal somewhere else, and the Bills do not bring in free agents because this year they can't right. because of Edmonds and Allen, they're not going to be able to sign any huge free agent names. So this offseason was the year to bring in guys to give them one-year prove-it deals so if they sign somewhere else for big money. You get compensatory picks. Right. So if you ask me, well, you're going to bring in a guy like Forrest Lamp for one year and then get a third round pick for him? Why not? Absolutely. Well, I'll do that every day. Right. I'll do that every single day. And that's the that's the beauty of the one year deals where Bean covers himself with the insurance policy saying, All right, either he's gonna stay remain on this team or the guy that we has may have may have a future here. Right. Or he's gonna play so well that he's gonna go somewhere else and then we're gonna get a compensatory pick for him. Right. Not to say that that's their goal going in. But it's a nice fallback plan. The fact, if they get two compensatory picks next year, okay, you, you have can trade five. Those. Yeah, you, you can, can trade, trade them. Plus, you have five of the top one hundred picks right in the in the college. So in college, so why not? Why not do it? Right. Yeah. Exactly. I exactly. Know. I like it. I love it. I really gotta think about this one. Mm. Who's kidding? Oh, I'm gonna do it. Oh, I'm gonna do it. Jesus. Did we already talk about it? No. You know who it's gonna be? No, no. Yeah, come on, give me one guess. Who's the one guy that I would, I would intentionally try to throw you under the bus to defend on that defense right now? On the defense? Yeah, on the defense. Who's the one guy that I would throw you under the bus to defend? Ramon Humber. Whoa! <laughs> whoa! Whoa! Listen, we are gonna fight. I didn't Ramon say Jabron Humber. Hamden. <laughs> <laughs> Co Simpson. No, not Co Simpson. <laughs> Kevin Johnson. Mm, okay. You're getting closer, actually. He retired, Johnson. Paul. You're getting closer, <laughs> Kevin Johnson. Dane Jackson? Dane Jackson. You see something bad about Dane Jackson, so no, we God. Go ahead. Come on. Let's hear it. The word begins with S. I will say, it does begin with us. I will say Sanders. Okay, we had an episode that we caught a little bit earlier this week talking yeah. about Emmanuel Sanders yeah. supplementing the tight end position in that. Right. I think Dane Jackson is your defensive equivalent to Emmanuel Sanders, where you may have asked Teron Johnson to get, get the slot, but we've seen as successful as he then, Teron Johnson has struggled. I have been a proponent, I've been a fan of Jackson, but I've been more of a proponent of him playing the slot rather than the outside. If you're going to go with Levi Wallace on the outside, put Dane Jackson in the damn slot because I think he's more physical. Punch him in the mouth at the line of scrimmage. I think he can stay with guys. He's used to playing man, physical man corner. Right. So put him on the slot, guys. And he's physical enough to come up on the run if you need him to. What? So – for me, I'm going to say Sanders, where usually you ask Teron Johnson to play that position. I think you're going to ask Dave Jackson to play that slot position. That's interesting. Okay, so we we saw Buffalo not draft a strong side linebacker like I was married to for months <laughs> right? prior to the draft. Right? right. I was on my honeymoon at the draft, <laughs> already assuming we had eloped in Vegas weeks before, right? And you look at the draft board, and there's like three linebackers that you're like, Seven. "Oh yeah, it's time." And then it didn't happen, right? Yep. And that and that's fine. I'm totally I'm totally okay with trusting the process. Totally okay with trust. That's fine. But, um, you know, I got played on drafting. Teron Johnson. So you feel Teron Johnson is more supplementing that rush linebacker role than anything else. I think for the same reason that you say let me let me see if I'm answering this correctly. 
we talked about offensively. Cole Beasley is the man coverage beater. Emmanuel Sanders is the zone coverage beater. Yeah. I think that Johnson and Jackson are reversed in that You're respect. Exactly correct. Because I think Jackson is more of a man cover guy in the slot where you could bring him in. And if you wanted to play man or blitz, I'm more comfortable with Dane Jackson than Teron Johnson playing that slot man coverage. And it's it's not a knock on Teron Johnson. I love Teron Johnson. Don't get don't get that like I don't like him. I just like Jackson more. I, I think Teron Johnson has shown that durability is something you need to be prepared with a contingency plan for him. Yes. Yes. And the fact that I mean, I was just to finish my quote. Johnson's great in zone coverage in the slot. I think he's great back there. I love when when they blitz him off the corner. I, I think he gets there, and uh, he's got great timing. He's got great technique. I just like Jackson more. That's that's about it. Yep. And when we saw Dean Jackson uh, put up an interception last year, zone coverage. Yeah. That was zone, right? So Something it's not that he can't about. do it. Yeah. Right. It's not that he can't do it. I I do agree. Levi's the better zone zone corner. You mean Turin? You said Levi. No, uh, no, I mean Levi. Oh, you mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're talking about apples to apples at the outside corner position, oh, okay, okay. Levi yeah. is, the, is the more finished zone corner compared to Dane Jackson. No insult to Dane Jackson, Dane. I, I really like Dane Jackson, too. I yeah. agree with you. His man skills are just are, are so much higher than his song skills. One more? Yeah, yeah. let's do one more. Uh... Oh, if you guys want us to do... Uh, if you guys have a player you want us to talk about that we don't get to here, put it in the comment section. We'll, we'll an- we answer all those comments. So okay, yeah. if, you, if there's a player you want us to mention here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we'll definitely do it. Uh, Gabe Davis. Sophomore slump. Oh, no! Yeah. It's just there's a lot of footballs that are going to be going around, right? You bring in Matt Burita, who's a, receive, who's a very accomplished receiving back. You're going to bring in Emmanuel Sanders, who's going to be taking targets away from yes, the tight end position. You already have Diggs, who you know is going to soak up 140 targets anyway, right? Like 140 you have, catches. We talk about. You have 170 targets. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There are 17 games this year. Yeah, so, he'll, he'll yeah, games. yeah. Stephon Diggs will have 268 targets. <laughs> um, it, I look at it this way, right? There's no element of surprise there anymore. No. I think teams kind of got a little caught off guard um, because. Gabe Davis, from a draft perspective, you didn't expect him to be as dynamic downfield as he really was. No. Right? I thought he was a very good college football player. I did not expect to see that impact that early there. You know what I mean? So, uh, I think it's going to be a – I think people are going to have really high expectations. I think it will be almost impossible for him to meet the fan expectation. If he reproduces what he did this year, fine. But when we start looking at red zone targets, right, he's a dangerous red zone weapon. But there's no bigger dangerous weapon in the NFL in the red zone than Josh Allen. Like, he's the most dangerous red zone weapon, certainly in this division, probably in this conference. Yeah, people argue Lamar Jackson, which is fine. But they, they, have, they have an argument. Yeah. They do have an argument. Yeah, that's, um, that's fine. I mean, he's a, he's a former MVP. And all stuff. But, but the point is, you make great points about, about Jackson, uh, about, about Davis, the fact that he does have a lot of positives, mm-hmm. and he's not really going to shock anybody this year. Right. But the fact that you did bring in Sanders and you have Beasley, it's not going to be a shock about Diggs either. No. So there's going to be coverages that are going to be shifted over to Diggs and Sanders, which will give Beasley and, and Davis more time to flourish, right. and they just got to step up. That's right. that's the thing for me. Yeah, you you'd mentioned it before. you got to make the most of your opportunities. Yes. And Davis might not see – a ton of targets comparatively to Diggs or comparatively to Beasley or even to Sanders. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that you got to you got to catch what's thrown at you, you know. Yeah. And he catching the football is certainly not an issue for Gabe Davis. No, certainly not an issue. We talked about a lot with him. Him and him and Hodges, they right. never let the ball get in their chest. No, never. So they refreshing. go get that football. It's so nice. All right, last one. Rut row. It's a tough one. Rut row. Ed Oliver. I say it's a tough one because there's a lot of people in the 716 and out there in hashtag nation of Bills Mafia who are not very thrilled with Ella with Ed Oliver's level of play. So, Ed Oliver. Can I use two words? 
well, I, you sophomore slump and you didn't chastise me, so I'd be a hypocrite. I would never do that. I hyphenated it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Double digit sacks. Ooh, what? Okay. For the, uh, the simple fact that you think not that many people are. Uh, okay. Let me try to figure this out. Let me try to word here for a second. Okay. <laughs> Mark's got to wordsmith it. You got to wordsmith it. Yeah. For the, the thing, same reason we just talked about Gabe Davis, right? Right. No, he's not going to shock anybody in year two because of what he came in with. He was a what, fifth rounder, fourth rounder. Nobody, nobody expected anything from him. Rookie wide receivers take a while to develop. You're in a new offense. Right. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I agree with okay. you there. Oliver came in as the heir apparent at the defensive tackle position in the first round, first pick, all this other stuff. So he already had a level of expectation for himself. Uh, one that Marcel Darius didn't want to take. When you're drafted third overall, you're the face of that franchise on that side of the ball. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that. Oliver kind of had the blanket of – of Edmund, but he was drafted higher than Edmund. Right. So he was kind of asked to do a lot of things. But when you're in a rotational front the way he was, you know, we talk about volume runners at the running back position. Well, Oliver is, is like a rhythm guy on that defense. Mm -hmm. So if you're, in the, if you're in a rotation up there, it's kind of hard to get a rhythm in what's going on. But he is an impactful player. I think with the additions that you had on that line and what you're going to have to try to do and the speed you're going to have, like – just for example, let's just say once you want to put Obata, Basham, Rousseau, and Oliver as your front four. In a third and long, I'm not saying this is I'm saying this right. is a third and this long. This is a package. You got a third right. and long. Oliver's gonna get there first. Out of anybody. Whoa. Because you're gonna devote so much attention to those other three animals okay. that I think you're finally gonna get Oliver one up. And when he's one on one, nobody can handle it. It's troubling to me when you don't have changes at the defensive coordinator position and when you put a resource into a player like that yeah and you're still not seeing exactly what you thought you bought that's troubling to me right like we're not talking about change in scheme we're not talking about change in terminology we're not talking about change of scenery you know in the, yeah. in, the in the defensive room it's the same every year right mm -hmm. so this year is critical because ed oliver is playing for his next deal right yep. because let's not forget and Oliver does have two more years after this year in Buffalo. And at some point, he's likely going to see a defensive coordinator change. So he needs to show that he can do it with this one. But then guess what? It gets hard because you got to show you can do it with the next one too. And that brings me to a sideline point. Do you think the same holds true for Tremaine Edmonds? What? You got to show what you can do. You got to oh, yeah. show, you gotta show that you can maintain with this one. What you gotta do with the next one too. So I think a lot of a lot of teams sign guys and then they forget coordinators a big piece of their responsibility, right? And their responsibility they don't always control because that's typically the responsibility of the defensive coordinator to dictate that to them. Right? I, I will say that it's different, but very, it's similar to me in this respect. You wanna put more and more and more stuff on Allen's plate. Mm -hmm. to see if he, if he can handle it without David. I think you do the same thing with Edmonds. How much can this kid handle? How much can he adjust by himself without me telling him? And then I'll know he, he can do it with any coordinator. Well, I will say that BFF thinks that Tremaine Edmonds is terrible. That's fine. I, I do not – I only put that out there because it's a ranking that people put credence to because it's got PFF's name on it, right? The guy's 13 I, years old. I mean, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> I can't top that. That's the end of the episode. <laughs>